This is The Focus Group with business insiders Tim Bennett and John Nash. I fought worse monsters than you for years in Hollywood. I know how to win the hard way. We're all business, except when we're not. Don't f*** with me, fellas! This ain't my first time at the rodeo. <laughs> Hey, welcome to The Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, John Nash. We're all business except where we're not. Thanks for joining us live here on Facebook. Also, if you're watching on our YouTube channel, which is also branded Focus Group Radio, you can catch the live show here every Wednesday at 1 p.m. East, and then we rerun the shows. Uh, at any given time, you can, can download the show, but then we send out an audio version on Saturday mornings for those of you that are still used to listening to us on your Saturday Saturday chore days from our old S SXM. Is it SXM? I always Sirius say SXM. SXM, SXM Satellite SXM, Radio. Satellite Radio. So, uh, so thanks for joining us. Go to focusgroupradio.com to learn more about all things Focus Group. And um, John and I had a long discussion this week. And the socks, if you ordered socks or you sent us emails to letters at focusgroupradio.com, you will have your socks next week. Otherwise, John can humiliate me on air. <laughs> we, had a, we had an issue. We had an issue with some tech stuff. Whatever, and email. So we apologize, and... blah, blah, blah. But it, not your problem. But we have your, we have your addresses. And, and we'll I think get if, you were, if people sent us a couple of notes asking for replacement pairs. They had holes in them. Or yeah. like someone was going to give something to a friend for their birthday. That You've taken care of all that? Yep. Oh, excellent. We'll the okay. whole thing. John, I don't know if you know, um, but today's September 20th. Mm -hmm. And I looked ahead in the deck and I thought this might have been something you discussed, but apparently the world's going to end on Saturday. Did you see that? <laughs> so, really? Yeah. So September 23rd. September 23rd. They're blaming it on. They said it started with the, started with the eclipse. So some, some crazies, once again, they said the planet Nibiru... Our planet X will smash into Earth on September 23rd, which will mark the end of the world. Theorists believe the mysterious planet is hidden behind the solar system. It's going to collide on Earth, killing everybody, devastating the planet sometime this Saturday. You haven't heard this? It's been all over the, the internets. Well, that's probably why I haven't heard it. I mean, is, is this the, the dark net that you heard this on? So it goes on and on and on, and so which was funny for me, and... and uh, and if, if Garrett or John or Allie could pull it up just to prove that I'm not totally crazy, they're in our booth, they're our, our, our uh, associate producers. Jim Baker, remember him of, yeah. of, of Christian TV fame who went to prison? As in Tammy Faye's husband. He's come back and he sells a pot, a doomsday buckets. Have you heard about this? So after Hurricane, so now he's, he's in the spotlight again. And when I was in Doomsday college, buckets. buckets. So I used to laugh at him, he and Tammy. Oh, yeah. We'd always bet how long it was going to be before. She started shedding the, the tears and the mask. She's got a new equally as, as um, lovely wife. And he's got these doomsday buckets that he started selling after Hurricane Katrina because he said it's about our sin. So it's Planet all from X. our sin. So John finds this. Yeah. Christian conspiracy theorists have gathered clues at the end of the world. And they get they cite they cite now. Bible passages and all this stuff related to the eclipse and all these other things that are happening and hurricanes and so forth and so on. So he's got these doomsday buckets. He sells a slop. It comes in five, five these huge fifty pound barrels. What do you do with it? One of them has twenty four Bibles in it. You can spend forty five hundred dollars and you get enough food for four years because the end's coming. And then the buckets can be used as toilets because you're going to need a toilet too. So. The show, if you get a chance to Google it, you just can't believe it. It is such a train wreck. I spent half the night watching these doomsday bucket broadcasts. He makes potato soup. He's got a fiesta bucket for the, for our Mexican friends. Um, he's got potato uh, potato but, but, soup, but does, mac and cheese. Is this planet just going to, the, the thing that collides with Earth and is, spells the doom of the, of the world, is that just going to be something that... Um, appears out of nowhere because it's going to happen yeah nasa doesn't know what's happening because the planet's hidden the planet we don't know about what john you're the sci-fi guy this is all very plausible well i just thought this might have caught your eye i'm surprised you haven't heard about this it's been you could tell i am utterly surprised have you guys heard this? about this no here i'm thinking i was late to the game no you're not late to the game you might be the only one at the game <laughs> <laughs> okay, but there's a lot out there. So if you go, so anyway, if we only got another three days left, thanks for all the time you spent with us. All right, so uh, I'll counterbalance this. Dis this is not even we. We're not even at caught your eye. Yet. No, this is just. But that's why I, th I thought when I looked ahead in the deck, I thought, oh, John definitely is going to talk about the end of the world. We're going to counterbalance the end of the world with comedy. 
So I came, well, I didn't come across. Um, Olbert had an actor on the other day who is now starring in Netflix, The Tick. But he's a British actor, and he does this thing called Sassy Trump. I had not seen it before, but we went down the YouTube rabbit hole last night. We were laughing so hard. We had to eventually turn it off after 20 minutes of watching. So what the actor does is he'll take a news clip. And he'll lip sync this. He'll just say what Trump said in a sassy voice. So he's a British actor. British actor, but he does American accents perfectly. So John called up the one of our favorites on North Korea. Uh, North Korea, that's not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury, <laughs> like the world has never seen. He has been very threatening. Um, beyond a normal statement. Uh, and as I said, they will be met with fire, <laughs> fury, time. and frankly, power. The likes of which this world has never seen before. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so it's a cross between Marcus Bachman and Liberace. <laughs> or the guy, to, the, since he's an actor, his lip sync is spot on. He just says what Trump says. And, and there, there's a compilation clip, if you go on YouTube, where he's on the campaign trail. We, we could not stop laughing. It was very cathartic because yesterday was the UN speech. Yeah. You know, Rocket Man, some parts of the world are going to hell. That it, you know, and so this was, I thought this was a nice counterbalance. So the world's ending, according to a bunch of Christians buying well, buckets, it's, making It's ending according salad. to Trump too, right? Is there like an it's end of the world out. egg salad thing too? Or? Well, there's all kinds of things you can get. I, the slop buckets, if you Google it, I, w I was going to bring a clip. The problem is they're too long, but you just can't imagine. They're hilarious because they're very serious about oh, this yeah. end of the world yeah, coming. I don't doubt that. And so they have all these buckets. They're stacked to the ceiling and his wife, they've all got these little headsets on and you get your doomsday. There's specials. There's different things you can buy and, and different you know, buckets. You know, QVC should sell this. Oh, it's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. And then they did uh, they did a whole thing. They they apparently did um, election coverage, and when Trump won, they were crying, and there was all kinds. Of, the Lord has spoken, and uh, yeah, it, it it's way it's as crazy as the P old PTL from the '80s, but even even so even far wackier, much more absurd. Wackier. So if you get a chance, take a Google of it. But uh, well, so who's on the show today? Today we have a packed show. Besides, of course, our caught your eye business birthday and. Uh, our friends from Deep Discount have a new release, which I think is really cool. We're going to be welcoming to the show uh, Criterion Collection President Peter Becker. And uh, I think you said that Peter's father started, was it his father started the Criterion yeah, he was Collection? one of the original people back in, I think, 1984. So uh, Peter's going to talk to us about the Criterion Collection, how they do what they do. And in fact, I was reading one article that basically said they, these are the folks that invented the supplemental material. So when you have a DVD or a Blu-ray, these are the criterion was a, led the way on putting director commentary, behind the scenes, storyboarding or whatever, uh, embellishments to the movie. So he'll be joining us around 1.30. And then we have a shop talk. It's a very brief article, but I think it's going to be a broader conversation. And that was um, Gap and Banana Republic. You know, Gap's closing a lot of stores, actually. And that's just a whole brand that's just... Well, Gap is banana, but Sears is J.C. Penney. Mm -hmm. A lot of brick and mortars closing, so a lot of retail. Be, yeah, and of course, Toys R Us just announced Chapter Eleven yesterday, right? Uh, they're going to bankruptcy protection to deal with almost what was it? Mil not billions in debt. It was some enormous. Yeah, number. I. Well, the Walmart of the world has mm -hmm. taken over all that business, correct? Uh, as they're yeah. doing now with grocery stores. One, I mean, one people guy go there to buy their food, which would be unheard of years ago. One analyst, a toy analyst, said that digital is just decimating the toy world. So now you get a device like uh, an iPad, let's say, and the real the real big thing is the games, the apps, the downloads. Um, frankly, I'm kind of saddened by this because I love toy stores, and as a kid, I love toy stores. It's the what if place. Yeah. What if I could have that rocket? <laughs> you know what I mean? Model kits, game, board games. You walk Things in. Things we had to think and do with. Yeah. But yeah, now, 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 with kids are buying electronics, even mm -hmm. teenagers and and the like. Now I'm excited to talk to uh, Peter Becker from Criterion. I, I've always viewed Criterion, and because of the very first Criterion film I got, which was Grey Gardens. Yes, yes. But um, it's smart and it's quality films, and they've also, you know, what you're going to get. You know that they've done the homework for you. 
you know that every you can trust that you're getting the best that there is out there on the market. Mm-hmm. So yep. um, they're synonymous with I always think quality and and uh, and trust and, and so smart. North Korea and frankly power. <laughs> Sassy Trump. And Tim says Another to me, thing you didn't come up with, right? I, I, after I showed everybody, like, I, I thought everybody, I thought it was going to be like the Coldplay thing where I'm the last person to the party on Sassy Trump, but apparently that's, it's nice being a little bit, a little bit in the lead on this one, but we were all, I come into the studio and Tim's like, another thing you didn't do. We could another have done you didn't Sassy do. I was, there was There was a couple things I was thinking about this week we didn't do. I didn't write them down. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll have to do that. So what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. I have uh, two quickies and a, a little thing that arrived while I was doing caught my eye, so I thought it was appropriate to put it in. The Maybe? first one comes to us from England, actually, and it's the headline caught my eye because it said, Man left unable to get an erection after being scratched by a cat. Meow. Oh, our little furry friends, the kitty. So apparently a 23-year-old man was left unable to get an erection after being scratched by his cat. Where was he scratched? Uh, he's from Belgium. Uh, a face or hand? He didn't scratch his unit. No, no, that had nothing to do with it. Uh, the, the, he suffered from erectile dysfunction due to an invasive cat scratch disease. And it's actually called... <laughs> cat scratch fever. Disease. <laughs> C- and they call it CSD. Cat scratch disease. Cat scratch fever. What I called it? Cra- is it cat scratch fever? It is a, uh, it's caused by a bacteria known as Bartonella hensilae. It's I up. love when you try to pronounce this stuff. I think I'm right though. Bar- Barton- Bartonella hensley. Just say disease. <laughs> it's picked up by a cat by a cat from flea bites or droppings ugh, around there. And if it gets so, if a cat scratches you and it gets into your bloodstream, then it causes the problem. Now doctors were able to treat this, um, and the man was able to then spontaneously have an erection again. Spontaneously. But apparently, before he was treated. Um, he would complain that even when he was calm, he couldn't think himself into having one. So it was a big problem there. The symptoms quickly vanished, and he fully regained his erectile function. Thank he was allergic Lord. to pussy. <laughs> in this he, case, um, the patient was unable. To, in this case, I'm trying the patient was unable to revoke erection despite his will, even during periods of calm symptoms. So th- this stuck around for a little bit. Is this was this the onion? I mean, where? No, this was the uh, the the sun. Which could be like the Inquirer, right? So he gets scratched by a cat. And gets erectile dysfunction. And they discover he has Bartonella hensilae, whatever this bacteria is. It affects very few people. The disease is relatively rare and affects about 4.5 patients per 100,000. So it's not, Still, it's not that common. scratched by your cat. Uh, cat owners are being warned to think twice when they cuddle their cat. When, when you cuddle pussy, <laughs> think about it. Be careful with your pussy. <laughs> that's for you. I was being crass for you. And this, this next one is a really simple one. And I th- you have a story to complement it. The headline caught my eye. It's from the Denver Post. Five nurses suspended for opening body bag to admire men's, man's gen- genitals. Five nurses at Denver Health Medical Center were suspended for three weeks after they inappropriately viewed a deceased patient's body and talked about it. A hospital spokesman confirmed. A tip to Denver 7, the local station, Denver said the seven. nurse, Denver 7, da, 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 the Logan, like, I'm, you Breaking know, news. nurses suspended for looking at genital. Could you imagine the, um, so they, they went to the body bag, they opened a body bag and they checked him out and then they went to lunch and they talked about it at lunch and another nurse overheard the conversation and thought this is not appropriate, but a different nurse heard the, them talking about it, then they were disciplined. Multiple spa- staff members viewed the victim while he was incapacitated, including after he was deceased. The, the, and they were just checking out his unit and his general build. I think that's how Don't it, you think they all talk about it anyway? The nurses admired the size of the deceased man's genitals, and at one point... <laughs> <laughs> they took a selfie. What that tells me is not a lot's going on in Denver. If you've got to open a body bag to get a thrill, then I'm saying that who's ever alive is not doing it for you, right? Don't you think, though? I can't imagine that this is rare. I suspect that it happens a lot. We just don't hear about it. Because the only reason they got caught is because they were talking about it at lunch. you got to go down and open drawer number 43 and open the bag. You're going to be in for a surprise. I mean, really. So uh, my story, but when you mentioned this, I was I had a friend of mine that was in med school, and they had a cadaver. And everybody, every. Two, two or three um, students each would have their own cadaver. 
and uh, my friend Chris, they got one named Coach. That they, and you had to name your cadaver. They Everybody named the cadaver. You name, you name your cadaver. So his name was, they were named Coach. And he apparently had this enormous unit. And everybody came around to look at Coach's, Coach's you know, anatomy. And he said at one point, <laughs> you had to know Chris, he's from the South, but he said, oh, he yeah, said that they had to slice the body in half and they had to go slice uh -huh. right down the penis. And he couldn't do it. And he goes, a couple of the girls just grabbed that thing and said, I'll do it and sliced right through it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> John's grabbing his head in the booth. I can't imagine this a was worse e thing. This was easier because they said his penis was so big that it was easy. It was like holding a little baby's arm. They were able to just slice right through. Coach. Coach. So let, let's watch him cut Coach. But I'm sure they must talk about that, right? No doubt. It has to. It has to happen. It's like when I was in the hospital at Subaru when I got taken to the hospital and I had that stupid Ooh. underwear on that Smiling was glow in the faces. dark. Yeah. And then I heard the two nurses talk because what it said no, and then when the lights went off, the underwear said yes. Yeah. And the one nurse says to the other, "You're taking yes man down for his MRI." Okay. And I was like, there you go. So they look. They were looking. <laughs> they pay attention. Taking the yes man down, down for, for his MRI. MRI. So she looked in the dark. Oh boy! And my last—it's uh, caught my eye because it caught while I was doing caught my eye. I got an email from my animation school, and it was my certificate of completion. Barbara's on animation. Bar yeah, so I, I put it in the deck just to, to show what there it is. Congratulations! I am now a. That's your sheepskin. That's my. Phil, congratulations, wrong. <laughs> Don't <Yeah>. tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what a great program. It was 18 months. A big thanks, a shout out to the animation mentor team um, and all the mentors I had in my 18 months there. It's pretty amazing. I'm but surprised you didn't do John Thomas or John T. Nash. You read my mind because the uh, when I got it, I'm so used to seeing. I you know I adopted the T part way. Because you know, in that move in the movie guy, right? Yeah, and John. Yeah, as, as opposed to being. John Nash, the mathematician, but yeah. So you're going to frame it? I'm going to print it out and frame it. And then the, I, I was just talking to you at lunch about the, there's a little graduation ceremony they're doing out in um, Burbank, California in November, which I plan to go to. I think it will be fun. My mom was insistent on it. You got to go out. You gotta I go think out you should it. go. You got to meet the people that some, well, the people are from all over the world, aren't yep. they? And then the, a lot of the instructors will be there as well. Well, I think that, I think you should do it. And you never know who you're going to meet. We always tell people to network. Yeah, I'll have to take my own advice. <laughs> You're acting like it's a chore. No, no, no. You, but you know, you know. You know, it's like, hello, 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 hello. <laughs> it does get tiring after a while. I don't think I've ever seen you get tired of talking. Well, I not, you, you, when I close the door and I'm like, oh, I'm tired. Yeah. yeah. Keep, the, keep the act up, yeah. <laughs> so what caught your eye? My, my caught my eye was, was very different. And th this goes under the category of, I don't know if you, you and I probably couldn't have invented this, but it's a very simple thing. So this came out of Ad Week, and the headline says, The story behind Big League Chew, the shredded gum that benched tobacco in a minor league dugout. So the novelty, I don't know if you know this, Big, um, big League this. Chew bubble gum. Yeah. So the last two days, I have searched high and low. I've seen this at the dollar stores. I can't find it. I went to Kmart. I went to 7-Eleven. I went to Wawa. I went to the grocery store. You get it at Amazon or something? You can buy it online, but it's supposed to be available just about Store, anywhere. Yeah. And I even went to where all the baseball cards were at Target, and it wasn't there. But anyway, I wanted to get some and try it. Essentially what it is is these two guys 40 years ago were sitting in the dugout, a guy named Rob Nelson and Jim Bouton. And Jim was a, 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 a Yankee uh, baseball player who got in trouble for chasing skirts and, and drinking too much booze. <laughs> so he was put on this um, little minor league team in Portland, Oregon called the Mavericks. And he and this guy, Rob, who also played uh, baseball back in 1977, were sitting there and uh, playing for the minor league team. And they were watching all these guys chewing the big red Lots man of tobacco, pouches of tobacco yeah. and spitting it and getting it all over themselves and kind of making a mess of it. And they both asked each other, have you ever tried it? And they said, yeah, but it's not for me. I didn't like the taste. I got nause nauseous. Oof, I didn't God, like they avoided it. it. It's like I went to school with a lot of baseball players, and I, I used to get disgusted. They'd take around the spit oh, cups yeah. and it's, the whole yeah. deal. So the um, so the the guy Rob Nelson said, you know, when he was a little kid, when he was 11 years old, he wanted to emulate a lot of the ball players. Ball players. So he stuffed his mouth with bubble gum when he was 11, and he always thought that that would be a fun thing to substitute. So he says to Bouton, he says, um, "What do you think about the idea of substituting gum for tobacco? It's always lingered in the back of my mind. Maybe we can shred some gum and put it in a bag." That way we could look cool and we don't have to 
Oh, right, because um, it's always the pouch that's Make ourselves anyway. ill. Okay. So, the, so Bowden said, my God, that's a great idea. I think I could sell that. So he invested $10,000. Nelson went out and bought a gun-making kit. In the back of People magazine, of all things, he said there was an ad for a gum, make-it-yourself gum kit. So they baked up some gum, and they used a pizza cutter and cut it Shredded. in shreds to make it look like you know, the tobacco. tobacco. Said it was horrible. So the first batch, batch tasted like hell. They did already have the name. They wanted to call it Big League Chew. They came up with that name in the dugout. They did one TV spot in the 80s, and they've done no other marketing since then. Um, and what they ended up doing is selling the idea to Wrigley. And so Wrigley Gum had, had picked up the idea. Somewhere in between the, the first prototype, though, and when they started selling it, they perfected, they, so they figured cut it out up, how right. to so make they, it. Gummy. Well, they cut it up and said, here's what it should be. And then obviously gave went it, to Wrigley yeah. and they said, okay. So they, they sold the rights to, rights to them. They uh, racked up $18 million in sales in the first year in 1980. And then since then, they've sold 800 million pouches. Currently, uh, Wrigley sold it to a company called USA Gum, and they're the ones who do most of the um, gum machine, you know, penny. Oh, yeah, I love that. Gum ball machine. Gumball machine. So they're based up in uh, upstate New York, and uh, they've taken over the distribution rights from Wrigley, and they moved production out of Mexico in 2010, so now it really is an all-American brand. And they said there's nothing especially unique about it. It's just bubble gum that's done shredded, and it's the novelty of the shredded gum and the foil pouch. And they said that uh, still goes strong, still has a strong connection with baseball. They said the best, there are different flavors. The best one for blowing bubbles, because they've tested all this, is the original one, because it has the flavor, best, okay. best texture. And could you guess what state sells the most? I was surprised by this. What state sells so the most? There's one state that by far sells the most of this big league chew. Um, not Florida. No, Utah. Utah. I thought probably because they don't, can't have I only, tobacco. I only you can't have tobacco or, or caffeine in Utah, right? Not allowed. <sighs> Could that be it? Remember, I was there, no iced tea. That's right. No, no. No coffee. <laughs> On a Mormon rain. I, I said Florida because I thought maybe the spring, all the kids go to watch spring training and stuff. And they that would make sense. Like the, the, so, so I thought that was a fun So I love celebrating that one. its 40th year. It's a cool one. But talk about just taking an idea and. Or, or no, taking a revulsion, ugh, chewing tobacco and turning it around and making it, picking up all the characteristics of it because you, that's. They're, they're, that's a whole thing. They don't have to chew tobacco to play baseball. No. But it's there's a, whole it's a thing. Yeah. And so turning that around into a product is very, very cool. Well, so that's your assignment. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. Is there something we don't like to eat that we can change? I, I, yeah, I still have my idea about ice cream. You, well, you no, your idea about ice cream was what? You never serve it with cake. I, I don't like that, no. And somebody just did that. Richard gave me some ice cream no. with cake. I wouldn't no, 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 no cake. No, I, um, some flavors. Oh, you have flavor ideas. My flavor ideas. I'm going to, that, that's my fall resolution. Here, I'm either. not going to, but I, I look every time I go to a grocery <laughs> store, no flavors that I like. The um, business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. The business birthday this week. Dale Chihuly. <laughs> what was this whole pause? Because I, I, so I know, you know who Dale, Dale Chihuly, Chihuly is. is a he's the one who glass, he's uh, an American glass sculptor and entrepreneur. His works are considered to possess outstanding artistic merit in the field of blown glass, moving to the realm of large scale uh, sculpture. sculpture. Yeah. And you can get stuff for a couple hundred bucks, but it goes up to the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think the stuff is tacky. I think it's it's a dust collector's stuff. And um, hence, there's a huge installation of it. At the Bellagio. At the Bellagio, that's right. how I so know. So there he is, he's a looker. The, um, <laughs> in 1970... Do you have a brother? I don't know. Did you know he lost that in a rubber band, that other I'm eye? I'm going to tell you how he lost it. Oh, oh you know how he lost it? I know it. how he lost his eye. So, um, so anyway, he started working in glass. 1976, he was on a trip in England and got involved in a head-on car accident. Ooh. Flew out of the car and lost his eye. Ugh. God. So after recovering, he continued to blow glass until he dislocated his shoulder in a body surfing accident. No longer able to hold the glass blowing pipe, 
He hired some others to do the work, he explained in 2006. He said, once I stepped back, I liked the view, and I could point out what I wanted done, and it allowed me to see work in a much different way and give me a different perspective and enabled me to anticipate problems. He describes his role more as a choreographer than dancer, more supervisor than participant, more director than actor. He's worth about $35 million for this class. Whoa, glass blower, $35 million. Right, and he's got a whole team of people that he oversees. Ch Chihuly's largest permanent exhibit is found at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. He maintains two retail stores with MGM Resorts. And uh, his pieces go, as I said, up into the six figures. The one at the Bellagio is located in the Strip. If you're ever in the lobby of the Bellagio in Las Vegas, you can check see in. And there's a picture. The, the third picture we have here is the Bellagio and ceiling. It, that's the, the, the check-in foyer. Like yeah, this. there's another one of those messes. I mean, look at that thing on the right. I don't know. It, it, I, the right, I'm not sure about that one. But this but, is the sculpture bit. But the, the people actually come to see the one in the Bellagio. Right, the next picture, there it is. That's the ceiling, and that's the whole reservation check-in desk. And there's a garden that in or garden thing. See that to me. I don't mind. That's I think. That it's, to me, I, I'm going to get cut and I got to dust. <laughs> that's your mother talking. Don't you think? Cut and I'm going to dust. He had a couple of workers that left him in 06. He sued him, Brian Rabino and Robert Candell, because he said they uh, he accused them of copyright and trademark infringement. But the courts had said that uh, you can't influence on art style does not constitute copyright infringement. Interesting. But he also said he settled independently. His quote was, I want people to be overwhelmed with light and color in a way they've never experienced. Well, they'd overwhelmed you. You, you have a definite, definite thought process on this, right? He's 76 today. 76. Is he still operating his studio? Yeah. He's still got a studio. He's out in Seattle. He's 76, Don Chihuly. So you know who um, else, another artist who operates sort of like that? You, you know Jeff Koons? The artist that does those, like he did bubble, he did that ceramic thing of Michael Jackson with Bubbles the Chimp. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he'll have other artists work in his factories, quote unquote, and create the art that he designs, but he's not necessarily creating it himself. But since he is the inspiration, he is, in fact, the artist. So it's a very, yeah. It's like be like you as an art director. I like that. I like that. I like that. I I'm to like, let's ferret that out a little more. Let's, let's dig down a little. Go. Let's All go right. a little, little deep dive in this. Get back to me and you. <laughs> So, hey, one of our partners here on the Focus Group is Deep Discount, and all month long, there's a, uh, the Focus is on Get That Focus, right, just like Focus Group. The Focus is on their Criterion Collection. There's over 1,200 DVD and Blu-ray titles on sale right now. These really are the best versions of the films you'll ever get. And one of the cool things about uh, our relationship with Deep Discount is John and I have loved Criterion Studios for a long time. So... After our break, we're going to get to talk to the president from Criterion, Peter Becker. But uh, until then, John, they've got some, uh, some new, release, new releases, folks. Out. New release, and this is a this sixteen and three quarter hours long, ten discs. By all means, pick up Ken Burns's uh, The Vietnam War. Now, I believe it's starting to air on PBS as Did well. Did you watch any I of it? I watched one of the episodes already. That I th probably the premiere episode. Like Ken Burns's The Civil War, this is in excruciatingly well documented and, and researched. And what I love about when Ken Burns does something is he lays out the whole pop culture, everything happening in the culture at the time. It's just not the war, but it's everything. And, and so the episode I watched focused a great deal on Robert McNamara and his obsession with numbers and efficiency and how the Pentagon had to, they collected data. Is he similar to like the Dave McCullough of, so is he the kind of the Dave McCullough of film? I would say yes, you know, because McCullough is like the almost depth, mm -hmm, presidential. Depth, right, the, uh, the biographies. So by all means, visit focusgroupradio.com. Click on the Deep Discount logo. You're going to be taken to uh, Deep Discount, and you'll go right to the Criterion sale page. Um, again, sit 10 discs, 16 and 3 quarters hours. And, I, and if you have it, I would recommend the Blu-ray version, because Blu-ray just looks so fantastic. So, um, Garrett, what do we say? Thanks, Deep Discount. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, it's the Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. We're going to take a really quick break. And when we, when we return, we're going to be speaking with Criterion Collection President Peter Becker. And uh, Tim and I have been looking forward to this for a while. So uh, stay with us and uh, come back and, and get to meet Peter.
brought to you by Volkswagen. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. Hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and coach, John Nash. We're all business, except when we're not. We're here live every Wednesday at 1 p.m. East, also through our YouTube channel, which is also Focus Group Radio. And then, of course, you can listen to us on any of the multitude of platforms that we have. The multitude. Do you I like, like that? that? I like that one. Yeah. Well, I try, I'm trying to find a new word now and then. You were better at SAT. Multitude of SATs, SATs than I was. The abundance. The abundance of, of, of the abundance of multiple Platform. audio and video platforms. <laughs> there you go. Either your mobile your, device, your tablet. Your SAT English score is going up and up and up. <laughs> but anyway, if, it's at focusgroupradio.com. Or how, how would Sassy Trump say it? Focusgroupradio.com. .com for all your needs, <laughs> special needs. Sassy Trump. As we, uh, as we mentioned earlier, one of the cool things about our relationship with, uh, with Deep Discount is able to talk with um, some great folks within the film industry. And Peter Becker, who's president of Criterion, uh, the Criterion Collection, which is perhaps the finest video distribution company in the world. Uh, for many movie buffs, the Criterion Collection is synonymous with... Um, the greatest classics of world cinema and really the go-to source mm -hmm. for classic or art house and foreign film titles. They're also known for their lavish, or I'd rather say complete, um, I guess complete sets of DVD and Blu-ray packages, yeah. many of which feature restorations of older films. So we're delighted to welcome the president of Criterion to the focus group, Peter Becker. Hello, Peter. Thank you. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Not not too bad. I before um, and I know John's got a million questions because he's a he's a huge huge film buff. But before um, we get too far down, I wanted to perhaps see if if I didn't do the best job of introducing Criterion, if you could let our listeners know <laughs> that uh, yeah. for people who might not know enough about Criterion, um, kind of your elevator pitch of of what you guys do and how long you've been around. Well, I'm lucky enough not to actually have to do an elevator pitch very often, so that's good. <laughs> uh, I think you did a great job describing uh, who we are, what we do. Criterion's a company that uh, for the last 30-odd years has been driven really more by a mission than by any particular medium. So, uh, you know, at the beginning we were making laser discs, then it was DVDs, then it was Blu-rays. We just launched a streaming service with Turner called Filmstruck, and... Uh, you know, so we've always been kind of medium agnostic. We don't really care whether you uh, love to watch movies in a the theater uh, with friends, uh, you know, with strangers or at home with friends or, or on your computer. Or on, even at this point, uh, you know, I think there's a whole generation of people who are watching on mobile devices. Uh, so it's never really been about, we've never thought of ourselves as a, as, a, as a home video company or as a theatrical company or a streaming company. It's really been a company dedicated to, uh, you know, seeking out the best films from around the world and presenting them in ways that their makers would want them seen, which is to say, you know, in beautiful restored masters and the correct aspect ratio with a real feel for how the film would, you know, would look in the theater. Often it means putting in the theater, you know, through Janus Films, uh, which is, you know, a key part of our, of our sort of uh, 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 working group of two companies, Janus Films and the Criterion Collection often work together on things. Uh, you know, we've had uh, had both classic and contemporary films, um, you know, screening in theaters regularly over the last few, you know, half dozen years, really. And um, so, yeah, I think you did a great job of, 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 of you know, talking about the, the things that we are known for. And I would just say that, that the real the key thing for us has always just been uh, stick to the mission, present films that are, you know, that are really uh, legitimately interesting from uh, from all over the world and from all kinds of different voices, and uh, and then present them in the best possible editions with the kinds of supplemental features that will uh, encourage repeated viewing, deepen the viewer's understanding of what the filmmaker is trying to do, and um, and ultimately really uh, bring kind of richness to your experience as a moviegoer. So, Peter, this is John Nash, and it's a, a pleasure to welcome you to our show. I'm, I'm an owner of many Criterion discs. In fact, I was just watching For All Mankind the other day. I love that movie, especially on Blu-ray. So I'm going to ask you something. Uh, when did you fall in love with the movies, and was there a movie you fell in love with? Because to do what you do, you have to certainly love cinema. Well, you know, in a sense, I'm very fortunate because I grew up with a lot of great movies uh, practically in my backyard. 
my father and my partner's father were partners in Janus Films, which was um, and still is probably the you know the largest library of uh, independently held international classic films in the states. And uh, so for me, a lot of a, a lot of the the international class, classic filmmakers were household names, even though I didn't really know their films. And um, I would say that my real film awakening came, you know, fairly late in life compared to, uh, you know, to, to some people who really uh, get the bug in their in their teens and and really suddenly wake up to everything all at once. I think I was probably, um, I think I was probably in college, and I think the first time that I really uh, had a just a, 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 a revelation about the way that you could watch movies was. Um, was stumbling into a class that I didn't take, but I went to. I audited, sort of. Uh, I went. I just went every week because it was so great. Uh, on marriage and remarriage comedies, and it was taught by a guy in the philosophy department named Stanley Cavell. And um, just watching the way that he would unravel a film, uh, you know, opened up for me the way you could watch movies. And once that way of watching movies opened up to me. All these films that I had I had had grown up near, but hadn't really understood or hadn't really bothered to check out, suddenly became a real kind of goldmine for me. And um, you know, and I honestly, in a funny way, I, I learned as much as I could about film from the Criterion Collection because those laser discs already existed. Uh, you know, many of them by the time that I was just out of college, and I I kind of rav- ravenously watched Criterion discs myself. Uh, and then in '93, I uh, I, I came into the company, and um, uh, you know, and 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 that's it's it's been an ongoing it's on, on ongoing passion of education ever since. So, Peter, you know, I think one of the important things about Criterion is that we ourselves uh, try not to look at ourselves as film experts. You, you do this long enough, and you develop a certain amount of expertise. But what we're really expert at is publishing the way that we publish, mm. is thinking on behalf of our audience asking questions as if we were in those seats, you know, as if we were not presenting the film, but, uh, you know, the, the people who are, who are showing up you know, with curiosity and, uh, and attention and a love of cinema. And, um, and then over time, we've also built up an incredible Rolodex of people who genuinely are experts in individual filmmakers' work, in film movements, in national cinemas, in periods, and all that kind of stuff. Not to mention, you know, the formal, formal aspects of the film, and you know, so it's 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 kind of the for someone who loves movies, it's, it's it's an amazing job. It's a real privilege to be able to do because our job is to approach it as you know passionate audience members and then try and figure out what the what edition we would want and who we'd want to hear from, and we're able to call up film scholars and filmmakers and um, you know and 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 uh, and the many kinds of film. Uh, trades and crafts that make that, that make cinema such an unusually collaborative art. You know, cinematographers and production designers and costume designers. And, you know, everything right down to sound mixers and editors, and all the way through the whole process uh, to learn from. So it's you know for 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 that's it's it's all organically grown over time. But but it's a it's a it's a privileged work. It's work that's a privilege to do. <laughs> you know, you know, Peter. You always um, Criterion Collection always has the additional or added value, as we would call in marketing uh, content. And as technology has changed, I know many of us were upset when vinyl went away, and then CDs came, and then CDs had gone away. And I know you guys have started a, st- uh, a streaming service, or uh, you, you can now stream some of the Criterion Collection. But what do you think the future holds? Will you still be able to be as in depth and still do a lot of the? Um, sort of packages you would put together on Blu-ray with the advent now of streaming, or is it just a different delivery method for you guys? Well, probably more the latter, but but I don't mean to belittle the opportunity that streaming represents. You know, as I said in the beginning, we're really very much mission-driven. So it's always been a part of our mission to try to dig into films, look at how they're made, look at how they communicate, look at uh, what role they played in culture in a certain time or are playing in culture, all that kind of stuff, uh, and to make and, and, and to research, uh, you know, all kinds of, of uh, aspects of, of whether it's 
whether it's filmmaking information, cultural information, whatever it is, to put that all together in a, in a coherent edition and to body out that edition in a designed package that expresses the film rather than just markets the film. That, so the whole thing feels coherent. And we've been doing that one film at a time or one cycle of films at a time. Sometimes there's a box set of three films, like Rick Linklater's Before Trilogy or something like that. You know, But most of the time, it's one film or one cycle of films at a time, and we go as in-depth as we possibly can. When it came time to launch a streaming service, it was important to us that the streaming service be able to play the commentary track, be able to associate supplemental features with films, that we could continue to express ourselves the way that we do on this, but in this new medium. You can't play a commentary track on Netflix. You can't play a commentary track on Hulu. You can't play a commentary track on you know, Amazon Prime or any of the existing streaming services. It was important to us that we there's no real there's no real um, consciousness in the streaming world of the idea of an edition of a film, you know, of a of a of that approach. So we carried that over into our streaming service, and then we added another dimension, which was that, you know, what we haven't been able to do over the last 30 years is move freely across national boundaries, across genres, across filmmakers, filmographies, and, you know, curate selections of films or approach cinema, you know, in a, um, you know, in a synthetic way. Big themes, ideas, approaches that have to do with how we, you know, how um, even, even guest curators, you know, what does Guillermo del Toro want to show you? Those kinds of things. Well, when you're working one film at a time, you can't do that. So this was an opportunity for us to present curated collections of films and to find different ways that we wanted to approach that prospect. How did we want to surface films for people? I think one of the hardest things to do, you know, is decide what you want to watch. And if you're not in the middle of a series that you're going to go watch the next episode of, um, you know, the question is how do we, you know, especially if you're a classic film lover or international film lover and there's decades of films from all over the world to choose from, how do you begin? And that's one of the questions that, you know, that, that, that was a starting point for us as we started to look at the streaming service because it was a, you know, a kind of question that we couldn't address when we're only moving one film at a time, but we absolutely had to address if we were presenting a large selection of films. So the idea really was, what's going to be your pathway in? Hey, and Peter, where, um, Peter yeah. on that point, um, the thing that fascinates me about the Criterion Collection, and it has for a long time, is that I'm a big film buff. I grew up in a family of film buffs. Um, I have favorite movies, favorite directors. I love listening to the auto. Movie? <laughs> My favorite movie? Yeah. Uh, you have it on Criterion. It's uh, Being There with Peter Sellers. Uh, oh, and, we had just, and it just arrived. Well, I'm so glad. That's a great film. I think it's a brilliant movie. I remember seeing it in the theaters when I was probably 12 or 13. It left an indelible mark on me for two reasons, the direction and, of course, Peter Sellers' acting. But So having grown up with film and being in love with it and ultimately being in love with owning the film, uh, via either VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, there's an interesting thing about having that packaging in your hand. It's a tangible thing. What challenges do you guys face? And I think the streaming definitely deals with one of these challenges. But, you know, introducing people to this incredible world and then layering up and introducing them to the curated um, experience of the Criterion Collection, it's, it's for Tim and I, our marketing guys, it presents a unique challenge because... Are the millennials just as interested in movies as we were? I mean, it used to be our Saturday night thing. Like, that, our social life revolved around going to movies. I'm not sure that's the case now. So when you guys sit around and you, and you face some of these challenges and you're talking about them, is this one on the top of the list? Well, I mean, sure, but I don't have nearly as uh, um, somber an assessment of the marketplace as you're putting out there. <laughs> you know, first of all, I should say that um, I completely... Uh, sympathize with and appreciate and uh, and salute uh, the, the the actual physical collection of books, of movies, of music. I think there is something uh, to be said for having a bookshelf that you look at and it reflects something back to you about who you are or who you aspire to be even, um, or where you've been, what you've learned, what you've seen. 
And I think that experience of um, of curating your own bookshelf is something that is um, is, is is still important to the people who are um, who are uh, of a collector's sensibility. And the Criterion Collection has always appealed to those people. When you talk about marketing, you know we've always recognized that there is a challenge in marketing the, these kinds of films because you have to be able to reach people who uh, are all right watching a film that wasn't made this year, are all right watching a film that may not be widescreen or may not be in color or may not show off their 5.1 soundtrack or sound system or 7.1 sound system or whatever they have in there now uh, that um, may not be in a language that they speak or um, have stars their household names. Uh, may even be silent, all of those things. And the more of those gateways you pass through, the more indelible experiences Criterion has for you. So, you know, we certainly have a, uh, a large audience of people who are primarily interested in, you know, later films, films in English, films that, you know, that, that um, I like being there. You mentioned that are massive classics but that are more familiar in terms of the people that they're starring or the way that they look and feel or where they're set than, uh, you know, a Japanese film from the 30s, for example. But, um, you know, the audience that, 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 is, that, that, that embraces Criterion is incredibly dedicated. So while, you know, if you're willing to pass through all of those various gateways and we have a thousand great experiences for you, uh, you know, or, or 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 whatever it is now, 800 or something. Uh, you know, Blu-ray experiences out there that um, that all will appeal to you. It tends to make for a very dedicated customer. So while our our audience doesn't grow by leaps and bounds in a mainstream way, uh, it's very consistently growing. And it's not actually it's shockingly um, not the case that younger audiences don't care about old movies. You know, what we were finding actually right now, if you were in New York uh, over the course of the last couple of years, you've noticed that we have more repertory and art house screens uh, in New York City now than we've ever had since, you know, in my lifetime, truly, since the golden age of art house cinema. Uh, and there's more screens being added over the summer. And there's more theaters all across the country that are playing, you know, Incredible things like Andrei Tarkovsky's uh, Stalker from 1979 has just been, you know, running all over the country uh, it, with its, you know, three-hour running time in Russian from 1979. Again, starring nobody that you know, but a great, a great film by a great director is still an incredibly compelling thing for new generations of audiences. And so, you know, while it's never been the intention of Criterion to uh, you know, to focus on huge box office, big opening weekend, make all your money in the first six weeks of release, and you know, and 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 then move on to the next thing. We've been stewards of long-lasting filmmakers' legacies, and we've been really carefully, uh, you know, uh, presenting them to audiences over the last 30 years and building that that core of um, of, of dedicated viewers. But it does increasingly uh, become apparent to us that the, some of the most passionate cinephiles are the youngest. You know, where people are coming in, will get letters and say, you know, I'm 17 years old. I just saw my first Bergman film two months ago, and I've watched 11 of them since then. And where should I go next? You know, there's a, there's a, there's there's actually a constantly growing community of people because these are these are these are amazing uh, amazing works that are going to continue to speak to people across generations, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, from, from our perspective, um, we're very happy with, with, with the, state of, the state of cinephilia, with the fact that there's, you know, that there's lots of places to go watch good movies now, and that there's more and more restorations happening around the world, that there are more and more films that are being presented you know, responsibly and along the kinds of lines of, of, uh, of, of what we've been hoping for and standing for all this time. So, I don't know. I don't mean to, to uh, you know, to try to burst the bad news, but I, from, from my perspective, this is a great time to be a movie lover. 
The um, aside from we're talking with Peter Becker, who's president of Criterion. The um, a quick question: aside from the USA or the United States, what what other country or countries are a powerhouse with um, these sort of films? In your opinion, from production or yeah, or, or just as a market force, meaning where 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 can you release such films and make money, or where are those films? Or where made? would yeah, where would they come from? So obviously, you have a lot of a lot of um, you know Hollywood films, but where else would would uh, would some of the films oh, come from? Where, come from? where people might well, not the expect. Idea, they would come from all over the world. Uh, you know, in in reality, uh, a, a pretty high percentage of the of the films from outside the U.S. is going to come from Europe, uh, uh, Asia, specifically Japan. Uh, you know, and we're actively trying to build the aspects of the catalog that over the years are, you know, that have been served by other companies or whatever else, but those companies may not be around to take care of them anymore. So as an example, um, uh, the Jenna Films Library, which, which, which is really the backbone of Criterion's international collection, uh, is historically very, very strong in Europe and Japan. Uh, one of their key competitor companies over many, many years was New Yorker Films, which really was very, very strong in Latin America. But as a result, Janice's holdings in Latin America are weak compared to what we'd like them to be. So we've been actively seeking out some of those films and some of those licensors to be able to, uh, you know, to be able to present some of the some of the great Latin American films that are currently not actually in release, classics that are not in release at the moment. Um, the same thing would be true for South Asia, and certainly for Africa. I mean, we've been working on films by a great Senegalese filmmaker named Usman Senben, uh, who is considered the father of African cinema, but there are many other African filmmakers that, you know, that we would like to be seeking out beyond this. But within Criterion, at the moment, if you looked, the things that you would recognize, the, you know, the, the largest number of titles might be from Japan, because we have Akira Kurosawa and Yasushiro Ozu and Mizuguchi and, you know, some really great uh, classic Japanese filmmakers who had prodigious output. Ingmar Bergman put out a great many films, and we proudly present most of them. Uh, and, um, you know, so you'll see quite a few Swedish films. You'll see a lot of French films, because France is, you know, one of the, certainly the birthplace of cinema, and also one of the places that it has been, you know, most, uh, most beautifully approached by so many different kinds of, uh, you know, a film artist. And uh, so you'll see everything from, you know, early uh, French films from the dawn of the sound period and, 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 and even the silent period, but particularly early Renoir films or Raymond Barnard in the 30s. And you'll come up through the French New Wave with Truffaut and Godard. And then you'll come up to the current day with, you know, Claire Denis and, and uh, uh, you know, so the, 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 you'll see the, the, the breadth of, a certain country's expression over the course of time. And, you know, we would love that to be true for the whole world. And increasingly, we're hoping that it will be. But at the moment, we're very strong in Europe and Asia. You know, um, Peter, it's a fascinating, uh, being the president of such a cool company is a, is a very cool executive position, I think. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, uh, you said earlier something that fascinates me, and I do agree with you, the, the rise of uh, art house movie theaters and even cinemas that just might not like during the week they'll do special screenings i i'll tell you a, a little sci-fi story i i learned that the uh i can't believe this actually happened but it's the 35th anniversary of the release of star trek II: the wrath of khan <laughs> it's, it's not in the criterion collection oh nor will it be <laughs> well i went to see it in the theater and it was the director's cut, and I and they had only they had two screenings in New York City. The theater was packed; every seat was taken, and it was like I had not seen the movie before, even though I've seen it like twenty Is times. Everybody your age? Uh, that's a great question. A lot of people were my age, and then younger, so it was like they were welcome to the Star Trek thing. But I think that's a great opportunity, and I think that's also uh, counterpoints. What and you did a nice job of answering my question earlier about the challenges of marketing and stuff. Um, Wait, are there titles that you're just never going to be able to get on Criterion because of all the rights issues? And, and is there a, is that a complex thing to, to navigate rights and distribution issues? Sure, but we're very patient. It <laughs> take a long time. Very you patient. Know, That's good. That seems like they would never happen, but they're happening. And there are other things that, 
you know, that seem like they ought to be to be able to happen, and they just take forever. Well, you know, you gave a you uh, yeah, gave an... is a big part of it. Some of it is also you know different corporate strategies. You know, because we are the Jenna Films Library, we largely control. So uh, when we're acquiring all rights in the film and we're doing theatrical and all that, those films will get acquired into Janus and, and we have more liberty to do, you know, what we want on whatever schedules we want and really coordinate a release across all platforms. For a lot of the studio pictures, um, I mean, the, for all of the studio pictures, the reality is that we serve at the pleasure of the studio. And over the years, it's turned out that working with us has been pleasurable for them, <laughs> that, that we've actually generated revenue for them, but we've also left their films in better condition than we found them. You know, we've, in general, participated in restorations, kept their filmmakers happy, often uh, reinvigorated titles that were, that were, you know, not necessarily attracting attention in their catalogs because they aren't, you know, readily mass marketable. They're not going to be able to... You know, they're not the kind of restoration you're going to take into Target and Walmart. And um, so, you know, we we serve as a kind of a, a weapon in the studio's arsenal. And so, insofar as they, they want to deploy us, we are, you know, always happy to find opportunities. And that's, um, you know, that's sort of a key thing. So there have certainly been times when, like for example, we released Philadelphia Story on Laserdisc sometime in the 80s, I think, and we've never had the rights back since then. It's one of my favorite movies. It was one of those yeah, films Tom that Hanks, I saw right? in, that, in that class I told you I audited at school. And um, so it's a kind of a touchstone for me. Or His Girl Friday is another of those films. Oh, no, it's very important to me. Yeah. And uh, in the last year, I've seen both of those films come into the Criterion Collection in beautiful editions that we've been able to work on. And that's a huge pleasure for me personally. If you'd asked me, are we ever going to see Philadelphia Story again, I might have said, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, I don't think so. But, you know, over time, it turns out that if you're patient, often the opportunities that you, you know, that you long for come around. And um, so here we are. So I won't say no. There's nothing that we'll never have. And there's lots of things I'd like to have that just take time. And, and some of those are for the best possible reasons, you know, like that, um, that they're privately owned by the families of filmmakers who have personal attachments mm -hmm. and have a hard time letting go. Or sometimes they're for the most frustrating reasons, like that the music in a scene is not clear and the licensor is not willing to let you go and clear the music yourself. Or something silly like that. And these things take time. But whatever, that's all, that's all just... Uh, that's, that's the day-to-day -day business of, 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 of being in a... Um, you know, in a in what really is kind of an artisanal digital field, if you know what I mean. You can't really. There's no there's no way to mass produce these things. Every one of these films is different. Their film materials are in different condition. They represent different challenges from a licensing perspective, a restoration perspective, and from the perspective of uh, producing supplemental features and documentation. Peter, I have one last question for you before we let you go. It's a personal Shoot. question. <laughs> Uh oh! <laughs> in uh, in ten years, in the ten years John and I have done this show, um, you have been the most mysterious guest we've ever had. Your digital footprint, um, and you could answer yes or no, or choose not to answer. But you don't have much of a digital footprint. We couldn't even find out where you'd gone to college. <laughs> so was that all done by design, or or was that no, too busy? Too busy. Too busy. Yeah. I, it's not. I mean, I, I you know. I, uh, you know, I'm not particularly secretive. Um, I, I just, uh, I think the important thing to me is the criterion is the story. And criterion is not me right. or me and my partner. Criterion is the 50 or so people that uh, together share responsibility for this library of films that we're lucky enough to work on. And so, and, and I think that criterion as an idea needs to be carried into the world by the things that we make, not by, you know, marketing the company or the idea of a company. So I just have never felt like it was important for me to step out in front of the brand and say, you know, here I am presenting you this brand. I was much <laughs> more interested in the scenario where we said, wow, this amazing film will carry our brand into the marketplace. How fortunate are we to be able to have, you know, Francois Truffaut or, uh, you know, or Agnes Varda 
carry our brand into the marketplace for us to the people that love those filmmakers so much. So that's, I guess, part of the reason I've never, I've never made myself particularly central to the story. It's a great answer, Peter. And when I owned my, when I used to own an ad agency, I would get asked a similar question, and I'd be like. You, if you you should know the brands I work for and represent long before you know me, because <laughs> I'm yeah. just some guy in an office creating some ads. Hey, I want to thank you uh, for joining us today. It's Peter Becker, the Criterion Collection president. Peter, one last quick question for you. You gave a, you gave a wonderful interview to the New York Observer, I think on the eve of the launch of. Uh, the uh, Flickster, the new uh, streaming service with TCM. Oh, no, not, not, not Flickster. That's uh, uh, Filmstruck. Filmstruck, I'm sorry. And um, there was a fascinating part in your interview about a movie that I adore, and I think yeah. you, it, and it was Silence of the Lambs, and you talk about how you curate the, and how you work with the commentary streams, and I will tell you that I've learned a lot about movies when I've watched them with the commentary track on, whether it's the director talking scene by scene about spontaneous acting decisions or a lighting change that really changed the look of the film or something like that. Um, something like A Silence of the Lambs, uh, I believe in the article you mentioned that it was available on the streaming thing. Is that something that you guys, I haven't looked at the, I should have done this before the interview, but are you still selling that on the Criterion page? Yeah, it's funny you should mention that one because uh, when you talked about films that um, you know that we that we wanted to be able to do silence is is one of the uh, is one of the films that I love most and it's one of the additions that I love most and uh, you know just in a in a sort of uh, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a slight scoop I think that that it that it, that it may be coming back in physical form again which is terrific uh, it's something that that um, there's there's a Number of Criterion titles that have long been in demand and have been out of print for a long time, and uh, I think a number of them are going to be coming back in 2018 in really beautiful Blu-ray editions with uh, augmented versions of their original supplements, better than ever. So, sounds should be one of those. At the time that I gave the Observer interview, uh, Sounds of Lens was also on Filmstruck, and it will be back for sure. Excellent. When it appears on Filmstruck, it will always appear in the best edition that we can present on Filmstruck. So it will include its commentary and supplements and all that stuff. Um, and that's, you know, that's our, that's, that's our way of handling, uh, you know, all of our existing editions is that when the edition goes up on Filmstruck, we want to include as much of the original edition as we possibly can. There are obviously little rights con considerations and things like that. But so Sounds of the Lambs, um, yeah, for us to be able to present, a, uh, to, to bring that back when we didn't have the rights in physical media, I think was uh was 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 super important opportunity that the streaming service allows. Right now, there's a film that's been up there that's been uh, that's been out of print forever. I'm not even sure if it's up yet, but it's going back up. Le Corbeau, uh, a, a great Clouseau film from uh, the period of the Second World War. Very hard to see. Really, really a discovery for me. Went out of print more than ten years ago. I'm incredibly proud to be able to bring films like that back through the streaming service. So you know, I think it all works together. We're trying to trying to keep it all keep it all working together. Well, you're doing a fantastic job, and and I can't thank you enough for making time out of your very busy day to join us here on the Focus Group. Uh, we will continue to be huge fans of the Criterion Collection. We've been talking to Peter Becker, Criterion Collection president, and uh, you heard it here first. But that's what, do you like? Do you like Silence? By the way, yeah, I love Silence. Really Foster. All right, Peter. Thanks for joining us again. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you and to to talk about Criterion and all the really amazing work that you guys are doing. Huge fan and a huge film buff. Tim and I are going to take a quick break, and when we return, we're going to be talking about uh, Banana and Gap, right? Demise of Retail. <laughs> the demise of re brick and mortar. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Back to the Focus Group with Tim and John. Because he has a lot of chutzpah. An entertaining look at the world of business. Hands are spinning, hands are spinning. Listen, laugh, and learn. I am not gay. I never have been gay. That's what Bush. Was that Sassy Trump or was that <laughs> That's Larry Craig? Hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. Tim well, Bennett. That's uh, George's father. 
Oh, you yes, mean the other ones? Friends. I am not. You know, I am not. That's Larry Craig. Larry Craig with gay. the flapping gums. Then George Costanza says that. I, that's Voice. The worst. So um, before uh, before break, John mentioned we're going to talk a little bit about the demise of retail here in our shop talk segment. John found this article. We've discussed this before here on the focus group, but this the headline here. This was a, a piece that uh, an author had written. It says nobody wants to shop at. They say the Gap, but it's actually Gap. We've been corrected before. Nobody wants to shop at Gap or Banana Republic anymore. That's interesting. And um, so there was a joke. There used to be a commercial in the 70s for Gap where it said fall into the Gap. And it's a jeans and T-shirt sort of place. But they just announced that Banana Republic and Gap are closing 200 stores uh, this year in 2017. And and uh, they're not the only ones, though. There's a bunch um, of fast fashion brands that are actually taking over from the likes of Gap or Crew or, or Ralph or Abercrombie, H&M, Forever 21, Zara. I was going to name all uh, those. Yeah. Uniqlo. Um, people can go in and get something stylish, inexpensive, and then it's trends out and then you move on. But these brick and mortar stores like Urban or JCPenney's, um, Radio Shack's closing 1,000 stores mm -hmm. this year. I just a thousand, saw a stores. thousand stores this year. Even CVS is closing stores, which I laugh because that's so ambiguous. They open them everywhere. Yeah. If anything closes, a CVS will go in. Staples is closing 70. Pay less shoes, 800 stores. So, in a, in a nod to the heyday of Gap, though, I, John, I think in the deck I built in a um, one of Tim's favorite ads. It was the last good ad, I believe, in the last good campaign that Gap, Gap ever that did. Gap did. And it was for the khaki swing. Khaki swing. Do you have the commercial? Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a look. Baby, baby, it looks like it's gonna hail. Baby, baby, it looks like it's gonna hail. You better come inside, let me teach you how to jive and wheel. Oh, you gotta jump and jive and then you will, you gotta jump and jive and that's when Swing was big in the 90s. Yeah. And then you go to Gap and pick up a pair of khakis and a t-shirt or an Oxford shirt to go out with on Saturday night. And then uh, the, the Banana Republic that I grew up with and knew, especially in the eight, late 80s, early 90s, was on another slide. I, I found some of the... They, they looked like you were going on a safari. A safari clothing. Well, the, the stores here's, had here's Jeeps. Remember the, they had yeah. Jeeps and giraffes and elephants? Some of the catalogs. The store, yeah. I mean, they did it to look like some turn-of-the-century you know, supplier of dry goods before right. you get on the ship and sail the Antarctica or wherever you're going. I mean, it, even the fact that they would display the clothing with no, it was just the, drawn as if it yeah. was on someone, but there were no mannequins or, or models. It was a very certain kind of a thing. Oh, and the quality of that clothing was great, and uh, we grew up with that stuff. I, I will say, and I do get in a fight with some, I, I have some friends that are senior executives that worked with Mickey Drexler, mm -hmm. who went from Gap to Crew. I think he ruined Banana Republic, when they all of a sudden decided we're going to be a flat belly with a little tiny clasp in the front, you need to get your pants altered. And then they had gone to J. Crew, and they totally ruined that brand. That brand had gone from go there to get a great pair of khakis uh, to if you weren't if you were above a 34 waist or 36 waist, you couldn't buy clothes yeah. there. Yeah. And the stuff, I don't want to spend $90 for a pair of pants. Or I haven't been into jeans. a Gap or a Banana Republic in, it's been, I'm not, it's not even months. Or a crew. It's years Have now. You've been to and, crew? No, J. Crew, not. But and, the stores you named earlier, H&M, this is an H&M shirt. I go to Uniglo on a frequent basis, and I'm very specific about what I'm getting. Yeah. Like sometimes I get the little fleecy thing for the winter at Uniglo. H&M, I'm always guaranteed of finding at least a decent shirt for sixteen ninety nine. You know, they're so what you bring up though, and this is my issue with a lot of these places that are closing, because they also say that online, Amazon, uh, the online yeah. shopping is taking over. My issue has been for me because I'm um, kind of a not an easy fit, I guess, for lack of a better word. I just can't buy pants online because inevitably they're going to come. They'll be too tight in the thigh, too tight in the crotch, mm -hmm. or the, the, they're not going to ride right or whatever. And so I always found I stay away from buying. I'll buy a shirt or something, a sweatshirt through that online. You know, that you know. But I know I'll need an extra large or whatever, but it's very difficult for somebody to buy pants. So they're saying a lot of these, all of this real estate, they're saying it, they're looking at um, other ways of repurposing. Are they community, do you make them community centers because they have a ton of parking? Do community colleges You're take them over? Malls and these stuff malls like that, that yeah. are going out. Do, do, do you make them senior centers, community centers, community colleges well, that come? <laughs> the mall that you and I used to hang out at when we were growing up in Connecticut is was torn down. Nogaduck Valley. Nogaduck Valley Mall with the little water wheels. It always stunk of like that mildewy water because of all the water features in the mall. But still, I'm with you. I cannot buy um, 
pants specifically without trying them on. You have to try them on. And uh, that's a for I and and you know the other thing the other impediment is uh, if you ever talk to a salesperson in a store, men are the easiest shoppers on the planet. If guys know their size. They'll march in. They pick what they want. They get out. In fact, right. the average shopping for a guy, shoes or clothing, could be 15, 20 minutes. They just don't want to be bothered. It's the day that I have to get pants that I, I really just like, oh, God. Because every year they change the cut. Yeah. So it's not like I could go buy, uh, let's say, Old Navy jeans and then go online and get that exact pair because, no, you, you got you to do wear it again. So The same thing happened to me with, and I'll mention the two brands, Warby Parker and Bonobos, famous for their online stuff. I got tired of sending stuff back. <laughs> yeah, but, well. But I, I try the glass. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm done. Let me go to a store and try yeah. them all on because. So they're, they're getting better than that. So Warby Parker now has more showrooms. Like right. when I got my first pair of reading glasses, they were Warby Parker, and I went to the showroom. They have racks and racks, and I'm like, like, how could you ever decide? But can you imagine if you ordered five, ordered five, ordered five, which is what I did, like a moron, and they kept I'd, coming, no, send them back, kept coming, It would coming, be better no. if you, you, were, you would have lucked out with me. I, or if I went to the Warby Parker store. I handed the prescription to a, a guy, uh, or no, it was a young woman, and I said, I, I said, I bet there's only like four or five pairs that look good on me because of the shape of my head or whatever. She looks at me, she walks around, she picks off four, and she said, I'm thinking number three is going to be the one you're going to get, but we'll see. The third pair was the one that looked the best. And had I done that the way you did that, yeah. oh, no, I'm no. not even sure I would have hit on it. So I do think we need the brick and mortar location to Bonobos. sample the product. Oh. You went through Bonobos. How many pairs of pants did you sell? I eventually back? just returned them all. Because you were done of trying to, if you had gone to a store though, I would have been able to select. Try the them on and say, you know what, this cut's not working. What else do you have? And yeah. figure it out. And that's where I think some of this craziness about online, unless you know, if you know, that that shirt that you're wearing is perfect for you and the jeans you have on that you bought at Uniglo or whatever are, are good for you, then you can go online and order them. Well, the flip side is I was at Costco the other day. Thank you for introducing Urban us. Star. Get the Urban Star jeans at Costco. Urban Star. So a woman was in front of me returning a shopping cart filled with, with clothing. Clothes. And the guy behind me said, they don't let you try it on. So she just bought any, all the sizes she needed to. <laughs> They probably kept what they needed, and then she returned the rest. So, but so that totally inconvenient. Just totally absurd, it's ridiculous. Right. Yeah. So, Don't you think? yeah, yeah, I do. So, in in summation, this was a quick little piece we had pulled up from the uh, website Jezebel, and the woman who wrote it basically said she'll never go to a Gap again. She went to an Old Navy, found a twenty four dollar pair of jeans that she loves, and when they wear out, she'll go in and buy another pair of twenty four dollar jeans. But she has no intention of paying one hundred and ten, no. or even higher than that. Anyway, you know what the moral of that story is: what? use your gift cards. <laughs> Stores are closing. <laughs> Do you know the moral of that? Use your gift cards. Right? If you, how many of us have gift cards ah. that somebody gave us from one of these stores, perhaps a Macy's or a Kohl's or a Co Michael? You know what? Kors There's or... tons of money locked in those plastic cards. All right. That's the show, folks. We want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, big thanks to Peter Becker of the Criterion Collection, president of Criterion Collection, for making time out of his schedule to talk to us about their library. And I had forgotten that the Janus Film Library was actually the core of theirs. And Janus, I remember the logo, the whole bit. They were always classic, good films. Before you say goodbye, goodbye, tell people next week what our schedule oh, is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Special show next week. Uh, yours truly is during jury duty. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so uh, the, our friends in the booth are allowing us to do our show a little later in the day. So we're doing a live broadcast, 6.30 p.m. next Wednesday. And it's going to be a lot. It's a throwback. Yeah, our prime time. Tim's list. We're going to do some John Says Pick That Flick. It's a prime time broadcast. We'll, we'll post it on social media as well. But if you're listening or watching on a time shift level, Guess what? You can join us live next week at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So again, thanks, Peter Becker. Thank you, Deep Discount, for all your support. Big thanks to Volkswagen Group of America. Uh, check out the latest edition of the Tiguan or, of course, the new Atlas, which is a very large SUV that's been getting great praise from the auto press. Don't text and drive. Arrive. No, don't text. <laughs> Why don't Garrett. we have Garrett do it? I saw Garrett just lean way back in maybe the chair. Maybe that's going to be a, also Garrett's goodbye. Don't text and drive. Hey, maybe that's a Garrett There's line. a Garrett. Don't text and drive. Don't Arrive text. alive. Arrive alive. Don't text and drive. Yeah. Arrive right. alive. All right, folks. See you next week. Thanks for being with us. <laughs>
with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Formerly on Sirius XM Satellite Radio and now accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com.